Okay, I'm, I'm going to try to put into practice that ways to well-being stuff, first of all. So guys in the lighting box, uh, if you can hear me, can you put the house lighting back up? Uh, lovely. I'm going to need that on just for a, a second. Uh, first of all, people in the back row. Hi. 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 That guy right in the middle in the blue. Hi. 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 <laughs> I'm Martin, I know your name, so I'll say hi to you. Good. Um, what I want you to do all now is, if you can stand up, can you all stand up, please? Lovely, if you can't, don't worry about it. Right, now, a little bit of a trust thing. Can you close your eyes, touch your nose? Touch your right ear, touch your left ear, touch your nose again, pick up your right foot, pick up your left foot, sit down again. How did you know they were there? How did you know they were there? Seven years of active play that's what proprioception requires. Seven years of practice before you know where your body is. And then my son, when he went through his teens, he lost that proprioception again. Uh, and we always used to yell up to him, aim for the gap, when he ran into his bedroom, because you'd hear, Oomph! and he'd hit his shoulder on the, on, on the edge. So we'd say, aim for the gap. Um, this is me. Uh, my point of view, of expertise in front of all you experts is that, is that I am a former child. Put your hands up <laughs> if you are also a former child. Okay, there's a worryingly few <laughs> hands went up. I used to work for local government um, and some of the committees that I went into, uh, I would question whether they just wheeled some of them out the cupboard for the meetings, just kind of blew the dust off a little bit. I didn't know when my mum took this picture in the nursery school that I grew up in for 21 years that I'd still be involved in, in play uh, 50 years later. So my background is uh, I'm a former child. Uh, I drove a play bus. I trained in the profession of play work to understand the 16 play types, the play intervention styles, the play work principles. I'm an early years teacher. Worked for MenCap for five years. Was head of play in two local authorities. And was the only school improvement advisor in the UK whose job was to improve schools through the quality of play. And I developed this program called OPAL during my time at the Beacon uh, School Improvement Service in South Gloss to, to try to come up with a, a way of sustainably changing the culture of primary schools to enable them to go from being, at best, average providers of play for every child in their school to being amazing providers of play. And that's what we do. We completely change the culture of, of, of schools. Now, being uh, running my own organization, I, uh, I work with colleagues. Um, and uh, my colleagues, especially when working from home, are not very well behaved. Uh, I have to discipline them. Uh, there they are. <laughs> I'm afraid Dilly did not meet her performance targets uh, last month. That's why she's looking uh, a little bit sheepish about it. As an as a owner of these colleagues, a dog owner, a pet owner, I have a very clear idea of what my responsibility is to dog guys. They need lots of love, they need lots of good food, Henry's particularly shiny, I'm very proud of, proud of that. And they need at least an hour's active outdoor play a day. And if they don't get it, I'll tell you I know about it because they've ripped the phone call cabling out in the hall twice and they've unstuffed the feathers in the, in, in the cushions. So if I don't provide the basic needs of doghood, and their physical suffers. Now I want to show you, uh, do you remember having kind of back of cereal packets? You had those uh, spot the difference things? Anybody remember them? Yeah, good. OK, so I'm going to show you two slides. I want you to spot the difference. They are both great ape enclosures. So one is in Toronto. Uh, and one is in London. So here's the one in Toronto, a great ape enclosure. The person responsible for those great apes has really thought about what they need for mental and physical well-being. So there's lots of um, hiding away places because it's quite stressful for, for young uh, primates to be out in exposed spaces. Lots of access to nature, of course, because a drop in access to nature means an increase in attention deficit uh, and stress. Uh, because they need to stimulate their, their 
incredibly active minds, uh, and lots of things to really challenge their bodies. And here's the one in London. Okay, where would you rather leave your young primate? <laughs> Toronto Zoo or here? You know, what thought have we given into the quality of childhood for these places where we are leaving these, these young primates to, to develop? Um, does anybody here own up to eating free-range chicken? Somebody, somebody down there? Lovely, you eat free-range chicken. Why? Welfare. Welfare. Okay, so if you're like me, don't mind eating chicken, you just prefer to eat a happy chicken. Yep. <laughs> there we are. So we have more guidance and more rules about the quality of life for a chicken than we do for a child. We say that in order for the mental health of a chicken, it must spend at least half of its daylight doors, daylight hours outside in a good quality environment. There are no requirements whatsoever for our schools to provide outside space. Under the, the guidance for the new free schools, there are schools without any outdoor space whatsoever. And if you were to sit down and you were to write the guidance on a free-range child, so what would be the essential parts for a free-range child for their mental and physical well-being, it's not, it wouldn't be looking like that. And yet that's, that's what we do to our, ch our children. So I do think we have to question, what is it about, about childhood that we are missing out in, uh, in our society? So when I'm talking about play and, and, and as adults, the way you can tell a difference between a child and an adult is an adult thinks that play is the stuff that children fill, muck about and fill their time in between the important things that adults do to them. So play is just letting us steam, it's just... A child thinks that play is the things that life is really about between the stuff that adults try to do to them. <laughs> so as a play worker, we learned that play is self-directed, it's directed by the child for the child's own reasons and with the child's own motivations. And you link that back to the ideas of, of well-being and wellness and how much of children's lives is directed for them and controlled by them all the time. And because we don't have a clear vision, then we have a, taking it back to Dilly and Henry, we have a choke chain response to when things go wrong. So we ban stuff. Traditionally, schools manage problems by banning it. Don't touch, don't run, don't pick up that, don't go in the bushes. And how, what a terrible, terrible message. You know, that school that said don't touch. Remember that very, very early study on, on, on primates and, and the ones where they didn't allow them physical touch and how distressing... We are teaching children not to touch each other. That is absolutely appalling, in, in my view. In many schools, we reintegrate junior and infants because who are we to, to take away that right? Who are we the ones to say that you, you can't form relationships like that? Where are we in terms of childhood in 2019? We are not in a good place, and we are heading into a worse place. We know that children should have, from the WHO report, three hours active play a week, uh, a day, sorry. They're getting about five a week. We know that the max screen time for over twos is one hour. The average statistic is six hours, plus all that time sitting in front of a whiteboard in school. I was in a restaurant yesterday and I saw a child restrained for the entire time I was in, the, in there, restrained in their buggy with an iPad chained, it wasn't chained but it was fastened in front of them. In the past that child would have been running around, they would have been picked up, they would have been spoken to, they would have been, had attention. They are being disconnected. So we know we're not in a brilliant place and I see this every day when I'm working with head teachers. I'm just getting more and report, more reports from them saying the intake that we get of our children are, are less competent, less able, less resilient, uh, less stamina. So we know, you know, that, that childhood is not going in a good place. And I think we've forgotten in our desire to fulfill our adult agendas what it is to be a child, what do children need. 
And what's effective? Uh, at Opal, we've worked with nearly half a million children, mainly in the UK, but Canada, um, quite a big project. Uh, we're working in, in France, we've worked in Australia and New Zealand. And universally, if you consult with children about what is important to them, they will tell you it is play, that I need time to play with my friends. And if you are going to invest, the title of my talk is Why Invest in Play? We know that the 1.4 billion that was invested in sport made sporty children more sporty. Well, that's great. You know, if you love football, that's great. If you want to play more football, I'm not going to stop you. But what about everybody else? That money didn't touch the other children who were not into sport and probably never are going to be. So why work in schools? Well, I think of the bank robber, uh, Willie Sutton, uh, interviewed by the New Yorker magazine. They said, so Willie, why do you rob banks? And he goes, well, Rob, that's where they keep the money. <laughs> why do I work in schools? That's where they keep the children. I've done, I set up all sorts of projects that have spread very well. I did play rangers, peripatetic workers in parks, we ran play buses. Penny for penny, working in schools is by far the most effective way I've been able to increase uh, children's play. It takes up 1.4 years of their time at primary school. And when I point that out to head teachers and say, if I drop my child off at your school and you had absolutely no vision for one day a week of what they were going to do, I would question you. I would, I would say, what, no vision, no strategy, you're going to get some people pay the minimum wage, not train them, and, and that's good enough. So the reason that we work with schools is it's very, very effective, it's very cost effective to work at a strategic school improvement level and to turn around their whole perception of what excellent can be in terms of play. And the reason that children have lost their opportunity to play is not because we're bad people, you're not bad, I'm not bad, schools aren't bad. But just like the polar bears, their habitat is being destroyed. The, the liminal, messy spaces where they can be has been destroyed. The slack time when we're not trying to make them into something. We're not trying to make them more intelligent. We're not trying to make them fitter. We're just allowing them to be children. And the permissions. I spend a lot of time, teachers will say, well, the trouble is with children is that they're not resilient anymore. You know, they cry all the time. I have to point out, it's you that's not resilient. The two key resiliences to play are hurt and dirt. Being resilient to hurt and being resi re resilient to dirt. And schools are actively making children incompetent. They're building incompetence into children by saying, don't get dirty, don't get hurt, don't fall over, go, don't go on the grass, don't go in the bushes, mud is bad. That's not a good, a good way. So we have successfully improved the quality of play for over half a million children uh, across the UK through our work. When I started in 2011, uh, when I left the authority, I did 11 schools. Uh, this year, me and my colleagues, we will manage to do 100 schools and have an impact on the lives of 20,000 children. It's not good enough. You know, for me, it's not good enough because I'm going to be 105 by the time I get to the end of, of the schools in the UK. So I need your help. I can't do it on my own. Every school needs to be doing this. Billions and billions of pounds worth of assets are being wasted by schools. The, the question is always, where's the money coming from? The money is there. The people are there. The children are there. The space is there. The prioritizing is not there. So the average school grounds are worth between half a million and 23 million pounds. Uh, that's one of the schools I was working with in London. I said, um, so you use the field, don't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, we use the field. We use it during the um, summer term on the sunny days. <laughs> so I said, right, so you know there's four weather conditions in England, right? It looks like it's going to rain. It is raining. It's just finished raining, or it's too hot to go out. <laughs> I have worked with schools that have increased their use of how often they go on the field, from 15% to 100. That means out of 190 days in a year, they are accessing their grounds 190 days. This school, when I pointed out to them that light green is what space year one and two 
were restricted to for 85% of the year. And I showed them that, and I said, this is your grounds. What are you doing? The biggest crisis in childhood at the moment is lack of movement, and you're panning them up like chickens, so you can control them, basically. It, 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 it's a control issue. <laughs> Guys, if you've got any spare change, you can change it. When I say to the schools, why don't, well, they'd get dirty. Okay, so we could get some wally boots and then their shoes wouldn't get dirty and they'd get wet. We could buy a coat and then they wouldn't get wet. These should be, an this should be legalized, this should be an essential part of every school uniform. We, as I say, we are, we are completely disabling children with the messages that's coming from schools about, about using the environment. Uh, so if any of you feel like buying a, a pair of well, welly boots and a coat for a school, please do. This school in Bristol, they spent five grand on welly storage. It sounds like a lot. They are now accessing an asset that's worth two million pounds, 75% more because they invested in a pair of welly boots. So it, it, it isn't rocket science. This absolutely sends the shivers down the <laughs> average head teacher. Uh, it's in one of my schools in the northeast. It's called the Swamp. Uh, only one person so far has gone face down in that, and it was a, it was a teacher. <laughs> and judging by the head's expression when she told me of glee, I'm not sure that they were that popular either. For most of my pre-opal schools, it's the four parents that complain the most that dictate the policy of, of outdoor play and risk and, and, and dirt. And we have to do better for our children. We have to have a policy on what, on what they need, what is required from childhood. So we need resilient workers. We need resilient schools. This teacher in the yellow, she happens to believe that an 18-month-old has the competency to use a metal spade in bare feet. And they do, because she's from New Zealand. And her attitude is, ah, oh, she'd be right. <laughs> this school in the UK thinks that children don't have the competency to manage triangular flapjacks. <laughs> and do you know what? They don't. So if we want to develop competent, reliant, you know, self-directed people, we need to give them opportunities to push the boundaries beyond what is easily accomplished. Uh, and that means risk. It means physical risk, it means mental risk. This is one of my schools in Bristol. These children are super, super competent. And they've come from reception in an Opal school. And I, had, I was talking to the, the play coordinator at that school and, and she was saying, oh, they're fine, they're fine, they've been doing this from reception. I've got no worries at all. Our friends at the Health and Safety Executive are the ones that have helped this. The statement that came from them that says that it is essential that all children have access to risk and we are disabling them if we don't do that has been a huge help. What is the impact on... I'm not interested in the ones where we spend more money on sport and we make them more sporty. What about everybody else? How many pictures of girls can you see? They're not doing girly play. They are digging, they are swimming, uh, swinging, they are carrying, they are pushing, they are pulling, they are throwing, they are leaping. If I tell you that 30% of those pictures are taken in a special school, you're not going to be able to know which ones. I know, because I asked my special schools to supply pictures for this. This is real inclusion. This is when every child doesn't have some targeted intervention. Every child's needs are met every day at their school. So the impact that we have is that we're not, doing, we're not targeting everybody. We're saying every child has the choice to have amazing play every day. We have, on average, an 80% drop in accidents and incidents, a 75% increase, increase in grounds access, and huge increases in, in core skills. Um, I am not able to provide quantitative research to back this up because the minimum cost for that is £200,000 and we are a small not-for-profit. The evidence is there. If anybody of you guys want to pay for it, 
It's there. It's, it's, it's out there. I know from my heads, every single one of them tells me the impact, especially on the hard-to-reach groups. So where does the future lie for us? We will, we will continue working with more schools. Uh, we are going online next year with our online group are being approached by schools in Poland, Slovakia, Germany, Austria, France. We, it, it works, so we're going to con continue expanding, but it's not going to work fast enough for the majority of children. And I think there are lots and lots of projects that, that do great work in making children more active. But I think we have to really, really question about are we altering children's behaviour to come up with the outcome that we want for our project? Or are we looking at what does every child need? And the great thing about improving the quality of play is that once you've done it, once you've got a school to do it, it is like that forever. At Opal, we hate repeat customers. Now, by that, I mean that when we leave them after 18 months, they are equipped. We have schools 10 years after the program's finished that are still doing great play. We actually love repeat customers and we go back if they want us to, but we don't want them to come back to us because we can change their culture. So the kind of play that we do, it's inclusive for everybody. It doesn't matter whether one of these uh, children is on, on the autistic spectrum. Who knows? You, you don't know which one it is. We don't dictate to children about what's appropriate or what's or not. These are year four and five boys playing with teddy bears on bicycles. Nobody likes to be in a sand pit more than a year six boy in a tutu. <laughs> I've seen them. I see them all the time. But nobody's given them a sand pit or a tutu for them to do that. We've just put in an 80-ton uh, sand pit in, in Filton Primary School in Bristol. And it's called Filton Beach. Uh, and it's, it, it's wonderful. It's social. There are changes that we make. We say that one-fifth of school life requires somebody to coordinate that. The average school of 500, there's 100,000 hours of child play during that time. We need to create a new role called Play Coordinator that coordinates that level of service. To do it for every child in the country would cost 70 million. It's not that much, actually, compared to other ways of spending your money. Um, I don't know if this will play. Do we have sound, guys? Um, what, what, what's good about it? What makes you happy about it? Just makes me happy because, like, we, we've now got stud, we've got Right, I'm gonna have to, I have to, gonna have to go on. Basically, within schools at the moment, there's three quarters of a billion pounds spent, spent on poor supervision of children. 80 billion pounds worth of assets are going underused, and a quarter of a, a billion is available uh, in the soft drinks levy that could be used. What's it going to cost? A pair of welly boots, eight quid a child, rain jacket, 25, storage, 10, the Opal program for every child in the country, 25 quid a head, a school play coordinator uh, is going to cost £17.50 uh, per child. So it, it, it's not expensive, it requires knowledge, and, and we've got the knowledge. So please, demand policy change that says that play is both a right and a necessity of childhood. Support initiatives, any initiative you can, that increase children's access to play. And provide us with funding, because I don't want to be 150 by the time I get through our, our, our schools. I want, to be, I want to be done before then. What are the economics if we don't do this? We don't know where we're going with childhood. We're driving towards a cliff, and we don't know what it looks like. So please, get in touch, read my book, go on the website, see the videos, uh, and do something, please.